So if you're interested, next week, Sunday, this will be our figuring out how to turn this into this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any other announcements? Elaine? Yes, I just want to announce that I am moving to Arizona next week. So, in my result, I, I might be back in the summer as I'm renting out my condo low enough that she's going to let me come in June, July, and August and, and stay downstairs and she'll be up there. So, I'll be renting it out to my grandson's mother in law. So, I will be moving to Carefree, Arizona. Righteousness endures forever. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Let us worship the God who calls us together. Please rise if you are able and join us in hymn number 267. <clears throat> Thank you. 
love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ, Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. With such assurance, we need not fear confession, but simply draw near to our Maker with humble hearts. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and sent his spirit to be with us always. If we confess that we have not trusted in the truth of that spirit to enlighten our hearts, to set us in the ways of justice, and to free us from fear, we may turn away from the gift of Christ's presence. comes to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. <clears throat> My steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that, that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose or purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I am sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands, instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This week, as we continue in our Half Truths series, we're going to take a look at one of the more popular phrases from American Christianity that is also a pet peeve of mine, a personal pet peeve of mine, which goes like this. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Because this half-truth deals primarily with how we read and interpret scripture, we're going to hear from the Gospel according to Matthew this morning, which offers us some insight uh, from Jesus on how we evaluate and receive the good news that he brings. This is Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The phrase, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, doesn't come up in daily conversation for most of us. That is, unless you, like me, have a habit of getting into arguments over what the Bible actually says. <laughs> this is often used as a trump card in the middle of a heated debate. The feeling behind it is usually something along the lines of, well, I believe in the Bible. And obviously you don't. Therefore, I win. Conversation over. God does have something to say to us in Scripture. 
I believe that the Bible tells us who God is, expresses God's heart to and for us, and calls us to act in ways that line up with that heart. But the most dangerous way to interpret the Bible is to pretend we aren't interpreting anything at all. We're just reading what it obviously says. If we are going to take the Bible seriously, we have to be honest about how we negotiate with the text of the Bible, with our own hearts and the world that we live in, and the work of the Holy Spirit, to hear the word of the Lord for us here and now. So let's start at the beginning. What is the Bible? How did this book that we see come to be? The Bible is a collection of ancient writings. Some are meant to be historical, some are poetry, allegory, metaphor, parables. Some are meant to be instructive, some are meant to be warning, some are meant to make a very particular point. To get to this Bible, this book that we can hold in our hands, every single one of those writings went through a centuries-long process of storytelling, editing, interpretation, translation, and more interpretation. If we start with the actual events of scripture, some of those events can be verified by other historical sources, some cannot. That's fine, because what we're looking for is the truth about who God is, not necessarily an historical play-by-play. -play. After those events, you have the storytelling. From eyewitnesses to second and third hand accounts, a consistent narrative starts to come together and is told to others by word of mouth. This goes on for generations. And then you get to the first writings. For the Hebrew Bible in particular, most of what we have today wasn't actually written down on any sort of paper until after the exile to Babylon, when it became apparent that the storytelling tradition was in jeopardy because the people had been scattered. In the New Testament, the Gospels weren't written down or compiled until somewhere between 40 and 100 years after Jesus' death. And it's also important to remember that the New Testament was written down entirely in a very particular dialect of Greek called Koine Greek. But Jesus didn't speak Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Everything we read in the Gospels was encountered first in Aramaic and then translated into Greek when the Gospels were written. The letters in the New Testament circulated from church to church, but even then they were read aloud at church gatherings. Very few people would take them home to study them. So now you have all of these ancient writings, some in Hebrew, some in Greek, but there were also other ancient writings circulating through the early church, things that we now consider heretical at the worst or unhelpful at best. There was no definitive list of which books were considered Holy Scripture until the late 300s, and it wasn't until the year 367 that Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, wrote up a list of the 27 books he thought should be considered sacred. Eventually, those 27 books would be compiled together in what we now know as the New Testament. After that debate was mostly settled as to which writings should be included, there were questions about languages, about translation and distribution. Remember that at this point, they were still writing everything by hand on scrolls. So to produce even a single copy of the Old and New Testament could take years. So many missionaries, priests, and preachers relied again on the oral tradition. Everyday churchgoers had no Bibles themselves, so they relied entirely on their priest, their missionary, their pastor, to read it and interpret it for them and with them. Eventually, Greek fell out of fashion as the, laid, as the language of trade and governance, and the Bible was translated once again into Latin. 
This became the official Bible of the Western Church for many, many centuries, even after Latin became a dead language. But one of Martin Luther's crazy ideas was that the people should have access to the Bible not only through their priests, but on their own terms and in their own languages. Between the early German and English translations and the advent of the printing press, which meant you no longer relied on sleepy monks over the course of years to produce a single Bible, suddenly these writings were everywhere, in the hand of every lay person who could or wanted to read them. But then you come once again to the issues of translation. Anybody ever taken a foreign language class? Spanish, French, etc.? Yeah. So you all know that there is no such thing as a perfect translation, right? Early translations of the Bible, however, could be especially difficult and problematic because they weren't just going from one language to another. Take the Gospels, for example. These translators were usually translating Jesus' words from Latin into their own language. But the Latin had been translated from Greek, which had been translated from Aramaic. Not only does that present language issues that make my head spin, but it also means that many early translations were working with muddled metaphors, unclear images, and story examples that made no sense to them. Fun fact. This is how the word unicorn made it into the King James Version of the Bible. I'm not kidding, it's still there. The word unicorn is found six times in the Old Testament in the King James Version because of one Hebrew word that no one was quite sure of. The original word probably referred to a particular species of wild ox, which had a single horn. However, there was no word for this animal in Greek, so the translators used a word that means one horned. When it was translated to Latin, that word became unicornis, which also means one horned. So when it came time to translate it into English, the translator saw that word and went, oh, unicorn. <laughs> All joking aside, every single translation of the Bible involves interpretation. That's why there are so many versions out there, and each one has its own take on what the Bible really says. If all of this is new information for you, you're probably wondering how on earth we could possibly trust something that's been through so many permutations and translations and interpretations over thousands of years. And that's the real question, isn't it? How do we receive scripture as good and holy and God's word to us when it seems so far removed from God's lips? The answer is simpler than you might imagine. We do it together with the help and guidance of the Holy Spirit. One of the hallmarks of the Presbyterian tradition is the idea that no one person has all the answers. I don't have all the answers. But when we come together, we can each bring what we have, what we hope, what we believe, what we see, and what we don't. And with the Spirit's help, we can find and discern the word of the Lord together. So if you're looking for a clear-cut instruction manual that is addressed directly to you and answers all of your questions about the world and how you should live in it in perfect detail, I'm sorry to say that the Bible is probably not your book. But if you're looking for something that tells the story of how God has loved and cared for and provided for and chastised and rebuked and loved and forgiven God's people throughout human history, then the Bible is your book. If you're looking to encounter the living God and have a conversation with God and with these beloved people about what God is asking of us, then the Bible is your book. Despite what 
a number of preachers might say, no one on the planet takes the entire Bible equally literally. Every single one of us is negotiating with the text, trying to figure out which commandments to prioritize and when, which stories should be the foundation of our faith, and which should go with the landscaping rocks in the backyard. <laughs> this is why we don't just read the Bible once and say, okay, got it, good to go. We come back over and over and over again because we're not reading an Ikea booklet. We are having a conversation with God. That kind of commitment is what Jesus calls the good soil that's been tilled and prepared and fertilized to nurture deep and lasting This is why God said it, I believe it, that settles it, is not a great way to live that life of faith. It's too shallow, and it can't support the roots that the Holy Spirit is trying to dig into the depths of our hearts. Here at Parkwood, I try to be honest about the lens through which we interpret the Bible. Everything we say and do rests on the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those things are the support means, the roots, the foundation that any other doctrine or interpretation has to rest on. If it doesn't pass that test of love, then it just goes right out the window. But aside from those fundamentals, I do want us to explore the Bible without fear. I want us to be able to encounter the love and presence of God through these stories, these sermons, these letters, these proverbs and poems. And then I want us to be able to look up from our Bibles and say, who are the people who need God's love and care right now? And I want us to be able to do that without worrying that someone is going to come out of the woodwork to yell at us about it. I want each of us, as beloved children of God, to grow a life of faith that won't wither and die at the first sign of confusion or be choked out by the thorns of bad theology or misinformation. So, I will propose yet another alternative to this half. Love God, love people. We'll figure out the rest together. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'll invite us to rise as you're able for our next hymn. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Since it's a short one, we'll go through it all the way twice.
taste and see that the Lord is good, and happy are those who take refuge in him. Surrounded and fed by God's goodness, let us return the gifts that we have received in abundance. Oh, 
man. Um, so Skip had surgery on his jaw uh, last week and is home recovering, but um, still looks like he had been in a bit of a fight. So uh, we'll pray for his healing and relief from pain. Thank you. Dennis. I am seated next to a mature woman. <laughs> and she is going to become more mature on Wednesday. <laughs> I, I assume that is the way of saying that Kathy's birthday is on Wednesday. Um, so, thanks be to God. <laughs> to all the teachers and students as they begin a new school year. Hope they learn more than they did before. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, prayers for teachers and students as they head back to school, um, that they will learn and grow and um, grow into good things. And that reminds me too, um, I live in a neighborhood with a lot of college students in Grand Rapids, and they are also starting and moving um, in last week and this week. So prayers for all of the college students who are heading back to college or heading there for the first time. Any others? David. A prayer of thanks to God. Who are in need of your healing. 
We pray especially for Skip as he recovers from oral surgery. We pray that you will grant him your healing, that you will give him relief from pain, and that you will help him and we to work through um, all of these medical issues. We pray too for Thomas, that he will be able to get the tests and procedures he needs, that the hospital and clinics will be able to uh, help him, to heal him, to tell him what's going on. Lord, we pray for your wisdom and your peace. We also praise you for Elaine um, and for this new season in her life. Lord, we pray that you will keep her safe as she moves and settles in in Arizona. We thank you for her presence here with us, and we hope and pray for her well-being and for um, a continued relationship between her and this beloved community. And Lord, for all those who are starting another new season in their lives, a new school year, um, a new school, a new college, Lord, we pray that you will grant them your wisdom, your patience, your concentration, your joy. Lord, we pray for teachers and students and staff, all those who will be um, teaching and learning and growing and Bless them, Lord, today and every day. We pray especially for those who are moving in or starting a new year at college or university or grad school, that you will bless them in all of their studies and in all that they do. We pray all of this, and now we lift up whatever remains on our hearts as we pray silently. and our voices together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And be us not into temptation, but deliver us from
Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what's good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faith heart. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. No matter where this week takes you, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and give you 